one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So the question is, how big is God? We're going to talk about that. First from science which is the study of creation. Then from theology, which is the study of God, right? And then a bit of anthropology, which is the study of our humanity. Uh, maybe that's too much for a Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I've got a bunch of questions. If you help answer them, one credit given to you <laughs> at TCC, okay? So we start with a creed. We've been doing things with the creed for the last bunch of Sundays, right? In the creed, you say that you believe in God. God whom? God, Father. Next part, creator of heaven and earth. Yeah, creator of heaven and earth, of all that was, all that is, and all that will be. Now it seems to me most of us as, as people can imagine a creation when it's limited to what we can see. If it's limited to the earth we live on and the heavens that we see, then we think, well, God is big, but not too big, right? Well, science is kind of changing our perspective in this generation, giving us a peek into a creation and a mystery far greater, right? So you know about the Hubble telescope and James Webb telescopes sent out, right? They're revealing a creation to be how old? Billions, 13.8 billion years old, right? They're revealing a creation filled with, oh guess, how many galaxies? A lot. <laughs> The estimation is more than one trillion galaxies, right? And how many stars do you think in each of those trillion plus galaxies? Double that, 200 billion stars in each of those trillion plus galaxies, right? And we're in just one of those galaxies, which is called Milky Way. Milky Way. I should have brought those candy bars for the kids, right? Okay. So now, how big is God in a creation of that size, right? All these heavens plus our own little bitty earth, right? All of a sudden, God seems much, much bigger. So just a little bit more science, then we'll get on to other things. Distance in space is measured how? By... Light years, yep. That's the distance light travels in one Earth year, okay? Light travels how fast? About 186,000 miles per, per second, not per, mi or per hour, per second, right? So in this time, light could travel around the Earth how many times? More than seven times. That fast, right? Okay. And our nearest, closest neighbor, Alpha Centauri, is just four light years away. So if you want to go for a visit, <laughs> take out your phones and calculate this. 186,000 miles per second, not a day, a week, or a month, but a whole year. 186,000 miles per second times four. Four years, right? So you should be getting a picture of a truly immense, immense creation. Is your sense of God big enough to embrace all of that, right? We're dealing really with a mystery here, a creation life force, a God so big, I think even our imaginations can't imagine something so great and grand. And yet this morning, in this bit of a gospel lesson, 
this mysterious transfiguration of Jesus surrounded by a long dead Moses and Elijah. An event filled with brilliant white light and this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved, listen to him. Could it be, could it be that we are be give, being given just a small peek, a quick peek into God's own reality, right? A peek into a mass of creation broken open just for a moment. Sort of like playing hide and seek, or maybe when it comes to God, hidden and sought, or maybe just simply a moment of peekaboo, right? Simply almost too mysterious. Is there an explanation? Can a pastor find words capable of giving a true explanation of this day? Or do we all just simply stand in awe? and simply say, mm, a theological mystery, right? Science, theology, anthropology. There we go. That's a peek, a peek into our own broken humanity, right? Now there's a portion of that short gospel story, I think, that invites our consideration and our imagination in this way. It's one that pulls our eyes and our heart right back down to earth. An anthropo, anthropological story, I'll get that straight, that draws us right down into our own backyards and neighborhoods. It's the part that centers on Jesus' baptism identity. This is my beloved son. It centers on your baptismal identity because you are God's beloved child. And what it teaches us should really be no mystery by now. You know, in the creed, we use it often on Sunday, but we use it every baptism, it affirms four things. It affirms that the God of all creation calls us, gathers us, enlightens us, and sanctifies us. Those are kind of big words. It calls us into serving our neighbor. It gathers us into community, and it opens our ears and eyes to see the loving work that still needs to be done, and then it sets us apart as servants of Jesus Christ and servants of all, right? You know this from the story, the disciples up there on the mountain with Jesus and Moses and Elijah were tempted to remain on Mystery Mountain. The invitation instead was to come back down to earth and get engaged in Jesus' work for the sake of others. Well, our invitation and transfiguration begins in the same way. So imagine this. I'm going to tell you a little bit of something new that I learned about the early church this week. In the early church, if you showed interest, any interest at all, in Christianity, you would first undergo an ex uh, examination called a scrutiny. You know what a scrutiny is, right? Um, magnifying glass, taking a look at you. Right? An examination called a scrutiny. Now, oh, interesting Christianity. The test consisted of simply one question. If you're interested in Christianity, what would the question be? Oh, somebody's got to say, do you believe in Jesus, right? That's the one that comes to mind. Here's the question, one question. Are you willing to help those in need? If you said yes, you underwent several years of preparation for baptism. Your primary faith work during those years focused on the care of your neighbors not just the people you liked, but widows and orphans, the imprisoned, and immigrants. The test of your readiness after those couple of years, your readiness for baptism, they would look at the time and energy you had spent caring for the overlooked and the forgotten. If they thought you were ready, then you'd be brought before the faith community 
and a church member would stand up next to you and tell the congregation, testify on your behalf about your growth and service and faith, right? And then during Lent, you got a six-week crash course in learning the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. And then finally, at Easter Vigil, you were taken to water and you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when you came out of the water, out of the pool, naked, <laughs> you were wrapped in new white clothing. Well, maybe it seems fitting that we've been looking at the creed and now are about to look at the, uh, the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, right? The focus was on action and not just belief statements. The fact about Christianity is this. Christians and Christianity itself became known as a people who took food and clothing and care to those in need. So here's what I think. And I think a little bit of science and theology and anthropology get us to this. We do believe in God. A God big enough to embrace a trillion galaxies filled with hundreds of billions of stars, so huge that distance is measured in billions of light years. We know that it's a creation mystery, a God-given gift that we're just beginning to scratch the surface on. But we also believe in a God small enough to be engaged through Jesus on our little earth this little speck of dust on a speck of dust on a speck of dust, right? With a closeness so tender and compassionate, Christ shares and shows a deep concern for the least among us and then invites us to do the same. We believe in God who created us out of earth dust and stardust and steadfast love and mercy for relationships and for purpose, right? Remember, when we mess up, we're really not to say, well, we're only human after all. When we mess up, we say, it's because we are less than the human God created us to be and become, right? No mystery about that. So this morning, if you would... Uh, Believe or trust or hold to these few things. Know that you are God's beloved. Know that you have been baptized into Jesus Christ and that you have been drawn into God's own mission on this little earth. And remember, maybe remember every day, that one key earthbound question asked of you too. Are you willing to help others? in need. By now, as a child of God, your response to that should be no mystery at all. Amen. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll take a moment and then stand as you're able and sing the hymn of the day. <laughs>